Okay, welcome back. We're going to finish chapter 26 and start tra chapter 27. Maybe this is where Red Eye dies. Hmm. What do you want? I asked dourly. There was only one reason I could think of him for sparing us, and I didn't like it. All I want you to do is something you were going to do anyway, Red Eye said in a tone both casual and infuriatingly confident. I just want you to do it on my time scale. Great. My mortal enemy had a quest for me. My life sucked. I like how you admit it's a quest. <laughs> We're getting kind of meta here. I like it. I want you to kill the goddess. My jaw hit the floor. Okay. I did not see that coming. But you serve the goddess. You're her high fucking priest. Red Eye scowled slightly, sitting back. I like to think of us more like partners. And sadly, the partnership is no longer beneficial to my goals. He looked me over, ignoring Zenith completely. And, after your handling of the crater, Alicorn, I really do think you have what it takes to succeed. Do tell, I glowered. As I'm sure you've noticed, the goddess controls her children telepathically. They're not so much individuals as they are extensions of her will, and they will remain so until she is finally put to rest. I nodded solemnly. There is no point working towards the freedom of all ponies if unity comes with chains, Red Eye pontificated. There is no room in the new equestria for slave masters, and no room for slaves. Zenith nickered. Not much room for you, then. I smiled, my own sentiment echoing hers. Red Eye regarded us calmly. No. No, there is not. Okay. Second time he caught me by surprise. What do you intend to do, then? Kill yourself? He laughed. Red Eye had a charismatic, likable laugh. I hated him for that. No, no. I plan to ascend. Once you have taken care of the goddess, it will finally be time for me to join Unity myself, but not as one of the rest of you. Some pony will have to take up the tasks that the princess and Pegasi left to run wild, after all. Some pony will have to regulate the weather, to raise the sun and the moon. I blinked. Okay, I've got a new theory. You're loony. Seriously. The goddess couldn't manage these things, much less an alicorned earth pony. Again, he laughed, setting my nerves on edge. Well, then I will fail. But either way, I will be out of your main. You won't have to worry about me further. And won't that be nice? Crushing two eggs under one hoof. I really hated the stallion. And what about all of your work? I argued. Damn it. The one reason I was at all hesitant to take down this monster was because even I could see the good his efforts would eventually bring about. I could admire what he was building, even if I hated how he was doing it. What about the schools? The hospitals? Rebuilding an infrastructure that will allow Equestria to pull itself out of this post-apocalyptic pit? Red Eye feigned contemplation. Oh dear. Well then, I suppose you'll just have to take my place and see you through. My jaw was on the floor again. Once more, he had blindsided me. <laughs> three for three, little Pip! Goddamn, I like Red Eye. He's a... Woo. Okay, I'm happy he's not a true believer, because that shit's scary. But, goddamn, that's three for three, kid! You got, you're getting your ass beat in a conversation! How did he keep doing that? Because he, cause he's, John, he's genre savvy. He knows how this goes. You're the main character. You take the quest. So he's giving you a quest. That's how this works. He, he's read the books. He's played the games. He knows how this shit goes. Me too. What? Red Eye smiled. Want you to? Or just expect that you won't let this all fall apart? Of course, I'm sure you'll try to find a way to accomplish all of this without the regrettable horrors of slavery. And, with at least the foundation I've managed to put in place, you might even succeed. 
he gave me a gracious bow. I certainly hope so. Then, added in a business-like tone, the goddess is still in her home in Maripony. It's a goddamn Xanatos plot! It's a goddamn Xanatos plot! Because, okay, his goal, kill the goddess. Lil Pip's going to do that anyways. Ascend, whether... So if, he, if that works out, you know, the sun and moon and regulate the weather, he could do that. That's what he wants. If he fails, his work still continues because Lil Pip has more... Lil Pip is a very moral and good pony. So he's not going to let all the foundation that was laid be destroyed. You know, the schools, the printing presses, all that stuff. No matter what happens, he fucking wins. It's a Xanatos plot. He gets what he wants. A rebuilt Equestria. A dead goddess. Whether he survives the ascension and is able to do what he wants, he's getting what he fucking wants. It's a Xanatos plot. <coughs> I realized there was another horseshoe waiting to drop. And so you'll just let me go. The black maned cyber pony nodded. Somewhat implicit in the request. Without even looking at Zenith, he added, And you can take your new zebra friend with you. The two of you seem to be effective together. Agree, and she has her freedom. Zenith stared at me with unfathomable expression. I knew she wanted her freedom enough to risk her life for it, to kill other slaves for it. Was she asking me to accept? Or was she warning me about deals with the devils? And if I refused to kill the goddess? Red Eye frowned. Well, I would prefer not to resort to threats, but let's just say that by succeeding, you will save the lives of your friends in the tower. No, I should never have sent them into that place alone. Oh, goddesses, what had I done? What, what have you done with Calamity, Velvet Remedy, and Steel Hoofs? I demanded in a frightened voice. Are they okay? Red Eye's one real eye blinked. Oh, you mean your assault team at the Philadelphia Tower Station? I sent Stern on ahead with a full squad of her best to give them a warm greeting. I'm sure at least one of them survived. I swallowed hard, feeling all the questions fall out from under me. I went to see them. Red Eye nodded graciously. He trotted to a button on the wall beneath the large screen. Stern, report. I have some pony here who wants to see the captives. The monitor screen lit up. For a moment, all it showed was ruins and blood. Then a hoof rose up, tapping on the screen. Hey! Calamity's smiling face and orange mane came into view. I think this here thing just turned on. I could hear the low grumble of Steelhoof's voice. Calamity, don't mess with it. Oh, hold on. Calamity said, looking slightly up. Hey, I can see little Pip through this thing now. Hey, you kid. This was obviously not the response Red Eye had been expecting. I felt a crippling surge of relief and collapsed to the floor. Oh, and you almost be Red Eye. Can't say it's a pleasure to... Whoa. Y'all are a cyber pony. I didn't even think those things were real. Red Eye finally found his voice. Calamity, is it? I take it you've killed. You're welcoming, party. That who you was expecting? Sorry, but they can't all make it on account of them being mostly blown up. Mostly. We kept your griffin gal all safe and cozy. Trust me, she ain't hardly hurt. And she ain't feeling a bit of pain. Calamity said with a mock friendliness that didn't touch the steel glint in his eyes. Figured things might have gone a bit south for our friend little Pip, so, uh... I decide we ought to keep someone for trade. I watched as the drawbridge lowered over the moat. On the other side, through the electrified gate, I could see Velvet Remedy and Steelhoofs flanking a thoroughly trussed up and glowering stern. Calamity was sitting sniper at an undisclosed location. I could almost feel the air grow colder when Steelhoofs' gaze fell on my striped companion. Red Eye stood next to me, protected inside an alicorn shield. The projecting alicorns were hidden in a sewer passage right beneath us, yet safely out of Calamity's field of view. Remember my offer, little Pip. Kill the goddess, he whispered to me, clearly unconcerned that the goddess's children might hear. 
judging from my experience on the roof of Horseshoe Tower. I strongly suspected they couldn't hear a thing at all. And you not only get rid of her, but you get rid of me, and save your friends in the tower. I blinked, then turned to him with a cross stare. I think we've already established that that threat is pretty stupid. I pointed a huff at my friends waiting for me on the other side of the gate. Red Eye cocked his head, and for a moment, I think he was actually confused. Ah, I apologize for the misunderstanding. I don't mean these friends in that tower, he said, nodding towards the rising white needle of Philadelphia Tower. I mean your friends in Tampony Tower. I felt my blood go cold. Now, I know that the damn building has already survived one balefire bomb, but do you really think it could survive another? You motherfucker! Red eyes, you motherfucker! How, how do you have a balefire bomb? <clears throat> Got my boat. <laughs> yeah. Uh, like I said, I'm I'm getting a little better from the flu. It's mostly gone, but I still got a bit of a stuffy nose and the fucking phlegm in the throat. Yeah. Oh well. We must continue on. Family. It wasn't a word I'd had much use for, nor a concept I'd felt any connection to. I had never known my father. A quite uncommon situation for a filly growing up in stable too. When my mother had been my age, she had spent a large portion of her time being, well. There were other words I could use to describe other ponies, but this was my mother, and for her I chose the words promiscuous and inebriated. Oh. Growing up, I did have my mother, but my memories of her were largely of the sit quietly while the grown-ups are talking variety. However, she did teach me games, and even I came to realize, even as a blank flake, that she did so more to alleviate her own boredom than my own. I cherished each happy memory of playing with her every game of boards and strategies and brightly colored pieces that this table had to offer. But even then, I never really thought of us as family in a way that attached special meaning to the word. Now, through a haze of pain, I realized this was changing. Had changed already, in fact, without my knowing. With the painkillers worn off and adrenaline no longer propping up my body, I could feel just how much pain I was in. The bandages had helped and probably spared me from bleeding out through the deep slashes in my chest. However, continuing to push myself while injured had harmed more than just my magic. But I was with my friends now. There was a feeling of completeness and safety. My body could finally relax and just hurt. Velvet Remini had slipped into mother doctor mode almost at the sight of me. Now that I wasn't mentally sniffing between her hind legs anymore, I found myself comforted by her fretful ministrations particularly considering that she did a much better job of mothering me than my actual mother ever had. In truth, these ponies have become my family. Family in that deeper sense of the word that means finding home, not just from the location you're at, but through the people you're with. And my family was having an argument. She's a zebra, Steelhoves exclaimed. He kept his silence until we were well away from the wall. But as we had approached the crumbling ruins of Java's Cup, Steelhose had finally questioned the presence of my new companion. I made the mistake of simply saying she was a friend. Yes, she is. I was weary and hurting. My breathing was shallow, and I felt like I was constantly drowning. I wanted the bath to wash off the blood caking my coat, the stinging powder still chewing at my flank, and the last of the nasty, biting insects that were somehow surviving alongside me. And... I wanted the bed that was at least softer than cement. What I did not want was this argument. Who has clearly manipulated you into trusting her, Steele have surmised. You can't trust them. Zenith had wisely remained silent, simply choosing to follow as we moved away from the wall in the slave pits of Stern's Philadelphia. But now, settled and perhaps feeling bolstered by my assertion of friendship, the zebra retorted, The war is long over and I had no part in it. Just because I have stripes does not make me an enemy combatant any more than that armor makes you a soldier in Nightmare Moon's army. Brilliant. Princess Luna's army, snapped the Steel Ranger, who had indeed served in the war two hundred years over. Not that your kind has any right to even speak the name. He turned to me. Little Pip, what are your intentions regarding the zebra? 
tell me you don't actually expect her to travel with us. Oh, heavens no, Velvet Remedy chimed in. I'm sure she doesn't. After all, it would just be foolish to travel with the sort of creature known for degenerating to mindless flesh-eating. Zenith drew up, staring at the charcoal-coated unicorn with a look of bewilderment bordering on resentment. Oh, wait, those aren't zebras. Velvet casually finished. Those are ghouls. Steelhoof stopped now, too, and I was sure that behind his visor he was glaring. Zenith huffed, still confused. In her exotic accent, she slowly asked Velvet, Are you saying I look like a ghoul? I hung my head. This was going downhill fast. Velvet Remedy's eyes widened as she realized how Zenith had taken the statement. No, of course not, she assured the newcomer, then cryptically mused. But some pony here sure smells like one. Zenith sniffed at her own coat. I rolled my eyes. Then, just to be sure, sniffed at my own. And gagged a little. I was well, mad. I think we found out who. Calamity swooped up to us. He had been waiting for us in front of Java's, Spitfire Slender held in his mouth. Java had apparently been, based on the large sign collapsed over the door, a milk-covered stallion whose mane was a wavy light brown with dark brown streaks, and whose cue mark was a steaming cup of what I hoped was coffee beans. But when we stopped moving forward, he decided to close the gap himself. He landed next to me, slipping the magically enchanted anti-machine rifle into a newly fashioned holster on his battle saddle, and offered Zenith a hoof and smile. Well, howdy. I wanted to kiss him, which was not a desire I normally associated with Bucks. Zenith looked hesitant. She reached out with a hoof tentatively, and then shrank back, wide-eyed as Calamity took it in both forehooves and shook vigorously. Pleased to meet you. I'm Calamity. Her foreleg was still shaking after he let go. Welcome to the team. This is it, she asked cautiously, still looking at Calamity as if she'd never seen a Pegasus before, which I realized suddenly was probably the case. Yeah, pretty much. Oh, shucks, Calamity said, still grinning. I saw y'all through the scope. Clearly little Pip here trusts you, and if she trusts you, that's good enough for me. Yes, Velvet said in a drawling yet ladylike sigh. Because Little Pip's judgment has been Celestia here recently. She was looking over my injuries with growing dismay. Okay, okay, yeah, it was a stupid plan. I'm sorry. I looked to my friends desperately. I knew it was going to be bad in there, and I didn't want to put any of you through that. I know I should have trusted you to handle yourselves, and that we should have stayed together. We're stronger together. I'm pathetic without you. I collapsed to my knees, suddenly overcome with fatigue. Velvet Remedy's horn began to glow as she waved everyone else to be quiet and stand back. A moment later, my unicorn friend gasped. By the goddesses, little Pip, what happened to you in there? Velvet Remedy knelt next to me as I stretched out on a mattress in what had once been a child's bedroom. We had invaded a small apartment building that had once shared a Philadelphia city block with Java and his cups. I could see the others in the next room. Calamity was Fucking sorting the small items he had scavenged from the apartment. Zenith was cooking. Steelhoofs was glowering. I gotta wonder why they even bothered. Calamity mused as he stared at the boards which he had pried from across the door an hour ago. They now served as wood for a cook fire. Ain't like any pony who's determined and capable enough to brave inner city ruins is gonna be stopped by a couple planks of wood. Why bother boarding up the door in the first place? Zenith had found some cooking pots and was brewing something sweet-smelling over the fire. Several other pots sat around her, each waiting for its turn under the flames. I marveled at our good fortune. Ever since I'd left homage, I had bemoaned our lack of a skilled chef. I winced. What I wouldn't give to see her right now. Instead, she was in mortal peril, and I... I felt myself flush with angry guilt that I wasn't doing something to help her right that instant. I cursed Red Eye. Why did he have to go after homage? I don't figure he did, Calamity suggested from the other room. I reckon he's aimed at DJ Pony. Buck's been broadcasting good things about you for a while now, so that probably gets him chalked up as a friend that Red Eye figures you'd want to keep from harm. Assuming that he hasn't simply surmised that you want to keep every soul from harm, Steelhoofs added grimly. 
and that you will go to absurd and dangerous lengths to do so. It's for the XP! I oh. I hit the wrong button! Whoops! I, I hope that I hope that didn't fuck up the recording. But wait, it's, it's for the XP! You don't understand! Everybody I save nets me like 50 XP. It adds up! It adds up! Why do you think I'm leveling up so fast? Like, why do you think she's leveling up so fast, you know? Buck's been broadcasting good things about you for a while now. So that probably gets him chalked up as a friend that Red Eye figures you'd want to keep from harm. Assuming that he hasn't simply surmised that you want to keep every soul from harm, Steelhoofs added grimly. And that you will go to absurd and dangerous lengths to do so. I felt the urge to remind him that it was a Steel Ranger elder who pitched the plan, but I bit back. Steelhoofs had never suggested or pressured me to go along with the solo mission, merely supported me when I made the decision to. Considering the tones of his previous conversation with Elder Blueberry Saber, I suspected Steelhose would have just as swiftly backed me if my decision had involved telling her to sit on my horn and spin. I looked from Steelhose to Calamity, again struck by the difference between them when it came to support. Calamity was loyal. Steelhose was... obedient. Not necessarily to me, but to whomever he accepted as in charge. He was a soldier buck, even now. Velvet Remedy's glowing horn passed over me once more. She was making sure she had found every injury. As I had expected, my broken rib and punctured lung had drawn the most reaction from her, including a whole host of dark looks at Zenith that Steelhoofs couldn't match. But she commended the zebra on not feeding me any healing potions, forcing confidence in her mending spells. She gasped as she started to pass her horn over my tail. Little Pip! She leaned close, her voice scandalized and sympathetic. How did you get wounded... there? That wasn't me. Zenith's voice sounded from the other room. What? Calamity looked up tensely. We were at Little Pip where now? I buried my face in my forehead, <laughs> feeling <laughs> my cheeks redden with embarrassment. Tell me, Little Pip, where on the pony doll did they touch you? God... God, that... I, I knew... I knew that was going to have embarrassing conversation at some point. Paid off a lot sooner than I thought. Well, no, a lot later than I thought, actually. Never you mind, Velvet told the Pegasus sternly as she opened her saddlebags and floated out an array of medical supplies. Calamity scavenging had restocked us well in that regard. It didn't help that my worry over homage had brought with it half-formed daydreams of that wonderful unicorn kissing that very wound to make it better. Gracefully returning us to the earlier conversation, Velvet Remedy suggested, I know you're worried about homage, but please, try not to let it eat at you. Remember, so long as Red-Eye doesn't act on his threat, he has something to threaten you with. Once he does, all he has is an angry little pip. And if he's half as smart as you make him out to be, then he's plenty bright enough to know that he doesn't want that. I bit my lower lip. Calamity stood up, shaking his head. I hate to be the voice of worry, but... The Pegasus paused uncomfortably, brushing a hoof over his orange mane. Well... I figure if he put that Meg spell at Ten Pony Tower, he must have done so before he'd hatched this plan to use you. So the only thing keeping him from using it is that deal of yours. I frowned. So, do you think he'll set it off the moment he knows the goddess is dead? I hadn't even considered that. That is, if I even do that. Calamity nudged his hat. I don't rightly know. But DJ Pony is a dissenting voice with a huge audience. Calamity's frown deepened. Most dictatorships I know of tend to go hell and high water to either discredit or destroy opposing voices like that. I almost asked of how many dictatorships Calamity knew, but the words died on my lips as a memory floated to the surface of my mind. Don't you believe him? Calamity had once told me. The Enclave has a vested interest in making any pony who bucks their ideals into a monster. Instead, I nodded, trying to give him a supportive look. Stern cuts out the tongues of any who speak ill of Red Eye, Zenith reminded me, putting a little extra loathing into the Griffin's name. I spent several years speaking nothing so that I might keep mine, she added. It is good to finally use it freely again. Steelhoves grunted. Now that we're all together, I don't see why we don't just call his bluff. Fly in and level his operation. Take him out. We gotta get artillery guns for this first. Deeply. 
First, because taking him out wouldn't be that easy. Elder Blueberry Saber was right about that. He's always protected, and he can get out faster than we can get to him. What I didn't say was that I wasn't sure I wanted to flatten his operation. In fact, I was sure that I didn't want to destroy the work he was doing. I wanted to free all the slaves. But that wasn't the same thing. Was it? Damn it. It was easier to know my moral stance before I discovered the evil fucker was also, as I could best see it, right. He was building a better future. Or, at least parts of one. And he was sacrificing everything for it, from his own home to your freedom. I recalled a conversation with Watcher regarding how, without what he called the spark, the virtues he valued could become twisted, lost parodies of themselves. I had found another in Red Eye. Generosity. Even generosity could wander down twisted, dark paths, especially when you're trying to give away something that shouldn't be yours to give. Steelhoofs nickered. You don't actually believe Red Eye has a mega spell, do you? I grimaced. An undetonated balefire bomb. When would he have acquired something like that? Steelhoofs questioned. Where? It's not like you can just stumble over something like that laying around. Velvet Remedy, Calamity, and I exchanged looks. Oh, no. Steelhoofs groaned. What did you three do? The building was silent, save for the crackling of the fire and the bubbling of the cookpot for several long minutes in the wake of our explanation. You gave a balefire bomb over to New Appaloosa. Steelhoofs exploded, pacing in his heavy armor, his metal-sheathed tail flicking in emphasis with every word. A town notorious for trading with red-eyed slavers. Uh, yep. Which one of you idiots came up with that idea? Steelhoof demanded. I silently tore through my memories. I remembered being concerned about sending the freed slaves back to New Appaloosa. Stunningly, I couldn't recall having the same concerns about giving them a mega spell. Calamity raised his hoof, a chagrined expression on his face. Yeah. This is... I forgot about that! Did I talk about that? Did I say how stupid that was? I don't think I did. Shit, I'm... Oh god, I'm insane Bo's a little pip. Fuck. Zenith asked, Why they call you Calamity? Yes? Velvet Remedy moved to sit by Calamity's side. Steelhoofs was fuming. You do realize that Red Eye is the only reason there is even a new Appaloosa, right? His visor turned towards us and only found blank expressions. That place was a small town dying in the dust before Red Eye pranced in and gave them a water talisman. You've got to figure they owe him. Calamity shook his head, genuinely surprised. Sorry, partner, but that one's new to me. I, however, merely groaned, putting my hooves over my eyes. I saw the bounty of our stable shared. The water towel has been given to a struggling town which now knows the joy of clean and pure water. Homage was going to die, and it was all my fault. My pit buck was clicking at me, not letting me ignore the water I was bathing in was radioactive. Velvet Remedy had a dose of Radaway sitting nearby for me to consume as soon as I got out of the grossly stained tub. Pure water was a rare treat in the wasteland. Even those who had it did not think to squander it on baths. Not unless they lived someplace with a water talisman like Ten Pony Tower, at least. And in the Philadelphia ruins, all the water to be found was irradiated. The clicking of my pit buck reminded me that my weeks in the equestrian wasteland had been, in many ways, blessed. I had avoided some of the more repulsive hardships that many ponies faced every day. I had never been reduced to drinking radioactive water from the bowl of a toilet. There wasn't much of a wall left between this apartment's bedroom and the living room, so I was effectively bathing in front of them. Zenith was still tending her boiling pots. Velvet Remedy moved between helping me scrub places that I normally called on my own magic to reach, and watching Calamity as he tinkered with broken radios he found in the other apartments, rebuilding one with parts cannibalized from the others. Steelhoof stood guard near the door. The radio Calamity had been rebuilding flared to life. Yeehaw! Welcome, ponies of Philadelphia. This is DJ Pony, beaming a light into even the darkest parts of the equestrian wasteland. You can't stop the signal, baby. And thanks to that kid from Stable 2, the message is reaching even the souls trapped in that celestial forsaken hellhole. 
Looks like our plucky stable dweller galloped into the heart of Red Eye's slaver operation and gave that old bastard a big black eye. In the form of losing nearly half his dirigibles and a small army's worth of slavers. Not to mention annihilating the crater boss. And she even took Red Eye's right hoof griffin stern down a peg. And that's not all. Our little wasteland heroine, our bringer of light, bucked right through the wall that Red Eye had built around Philadelphia's airwaves, bringing my humble message into the one place I could never reach before. Thank you, stable dweller. I sunk deeper into the bath and moaned. The elation I felt at hearing Amage's voice, disguised as it was, in this horrible place battled the humiliation and dismay of hearing my royal fuck-up described as a brilliant victory. I did not... Don't worry, little Pip. Y'all get used to it. Like, pl pl play some D&D &D or Shadowrun, okay? Royal fuck-ups are the name of the game because they're more fun. Okay, a well-executed plan that goes according to plan, that's not fun. I mean, it gets shit done and it's efficient, but it's not fun. Royal fuck-ups are fun. You know... Oh, anyways, that's it. That's all. I got the two videos out like I promised. I'm off to go record some Log Horizon. See...